Welcome back to ECE 442-542. Not a whole lot of time left this semester. Six more lectures or class periods in this class, if I'm counting correctly. Doesn't give us a lot of time. You have one more exam, the final. And please note that that's not on a Monday or a Wednesday. If you've been learning how to think digital control just on Monday and Wednesday, you need to start shifting that a little bit so that you're ready for the final exam on Thursday. I think that's the last day of finals, and it's at 1 o'clock, so you'll have to set your alarm clock a little earlier that particular day if you're used to arising at 5 p.m. most days to get to this class at 5.30 p.m. You can't do that on the final, and please don't do it on Wednesday. Get up at 5 and pull an all-nighter and come in at 1 to take the exam on Thursday. All the studies seem to indicate that we need our sleep. Not that we follow that, but we do need to have our sleep so that we can start processing information effectively. Yes. That should not have changed since the beginning of the semester, has it? I hope you've put it in wrong. I double-checked that even today. But look at the syllabus, look online, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it is scheduled when we have a five or a five thirty, we go to the Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule of lex final exams and look at five o'clock, and that schedules us for Thursday the fourteenth at one PM, I believe. I always question that because it's not on a Monday or a Wednesday, so I double checked that this morning when I was trying to put that in. A few, pardon? Okay, good. Now I feel a little bit better. Not much. I wasn't too worried about the final, but I, I'm worried about the next six times that we meet. I need to get the rest of the contents of the semester covered. That has me more stressed than the final exam. But you can stress about the final, and it's okay to be starting to stress about that now. Homework 7 is due on the 1st of May. That's just around the corner. It's on, that's a Friday, if you're keeping track. Not this Friday, but I believe it's the next Friday. If you are in 542, the project is due the following Wednesday, which is the last day of classes. And that project, not that you want to wait, but it can be turned in at 11.59, I believe, into the Dropbox. Teacher course evaluations, which are important to me and the department. Some administration people in the department look at that. I, as an instructor, look at that. So it is important to get your feedback. And if I only get what's presently responded, that's probably not a good enough response rate. Right now, 14 of you have responded. Thank you. I have no idea who that 14 is. I have no idea when you do submit your TCE, but it keeps track of your email, I think, as far as whether you have submitted or not. And you'll keep getting pestered with emails. That's my understanding. I don't know. But I will keep reminding you if you haven't. If you have already, done the TCEs, thank you. That is important information for me to try to improve the class. And one more thing on the TCEs. I see it right before I submit final grades. No, that's a joke. I don't see the TCEs until probably June, way beyond final grades have been assigned. So don't feel like Ah, uh, he's going to know, and it's all anonymous anyway, and especially since it's online, I can't tell if you're typing or John next to you is typing in your response. It all is the same to me. 
You want, well, you don't have that luxury. Oh, you mean tonight's exam? Yeah, yeah, make sure you, yeah, this is not the best time maybe to be telling you about the TCEs the day that I return your exam number three, but I do have those to be returned. And they were okay. We Basically, the average was 88, I believe. Go figure. What we want to do today, now that I'm trying to race through the material and I've spent how much time on TCEs, but it's important for the TCEs, I want to finish up the root locus so that you can get comfortable with sketching those, more so than what we already are, and that's rule number four and number five, and we'll try to do that via some examples. And if you haven't already heard the inside whisper, MATLAB sketches root locus. So you can plug in these transfer functions and sketch them in MATLAB to check your work if you want when you're doing your homework. But I want you to get comfortable sketching those by hand. In homework seven, it's not so much how accurate it is sketched, but I want you to get a feel for the way or the shape that these root loci exhibit so that you get better with your shakers. And you know what I'm meaning when I say get better with your shakers. Yes? You have a pole shaker and a zero shaker, and you're sprinkling those in this generic controller design, or even with the PID design. Actually, with the PID design, you only have one shaker, and that's the zero shaker. The poles are fixed. You can sprinkle a couple of zeros onto the Z-plane to try to bend, move, or shape the root locus in a more desirable manner. And what do you have to have at the bare minimum, usually, when you're talking about control? And let's say closed, closed loop poles. That was, that's an easy question. What do you, where do you need your closed loop poles in a digital system? Inside the unit circle, which means if you're sketching root loci, you need all of the branches to at some point simultaneously be inside the unit circle for some value or range of k. It doesn't have to happen for all k, but you hope that you've selected with your shakers the appropriate poles and zeros so that at some range of k you can at least stabilize your system. So you can adjust that knob, that k knob, such that all of the branches, and how many branches of the root locus do you have? Show of fingers. One, two, three, four, or five. How many root locus branches do you have on the count of three? One, two, three. Why is no one showing me finger? Well, maybe I shouldn't. I didn't give you enough information, did I? Which is fine. So you didn't necessarily, you could still have been sitting on your fingers, and that would have been a fine answer. You could have given me any amount of fingers, and I would have had to say, oh, what was your system? And you would say, oh, my system had two open loop poles, that's why I gave you the two sign, or two fingers. Well, that's only if you have a pure gain controller, isn't it? If you added some more poles with your shaker, then it might have more poles or more branches of your root locus diagram. I was going to speed up. What am I doing? But All right, so let's get started. Root locus rules. These are continued. We already have one, two, and three. And the first two aren't that major. The third one is the breakaway and reentry. And you don't have to have both, do you? You could have breakaway, you could have reentry, or you could have both. And where will the breakaways occur? 
and I enjoyed some of the answers or responses. Some of you started talking about French bread on exam number three. That, that's fine. That sort of gave me a chuckle. I needed that after spending however long I was grading the 80 plus exams. But somebody said, oh, it's not on the infinitely long piece of your French bread. I forget even what the question was. But I do remember the answer. That comment, I guess. What in the world was I talking about? Oh, where's the breakaway point? Where do those occur? Usually between two poles, but those poles have to have what, branches of the root locus between them or you're not going to have a breakaway between those two poles on that real axis segment. You could have two poles that are next to each other, but if the root locus is not on that line segment that connects them, you're not going to have a breakaway between those two poles. Is that clear? Talking with my hands and fingers. Here's our generic block diagram and this G bar of Z, why am I calling it G bar of Z versus just G of Z? If I needed to use more ink, I wanted to put a bar over the G. Is there some significance to the bar? I mean, we're grads, or we're college students, we like bars, right? So I just thought I'd put a bar over the G. No, that means that we could have the plant, G, and the controller, D or C, depending on the semester, I may call it something different. I've put all of those poles and zeros into this G bar and I've factored out the gain K that we can adjust. That's why it's G bar versus just a G. All right, the next two rules, I'm just going to scroll through, but we will go through the insight or the strategies for applying these later. So I don't care if you don't have enough time to write these down. You can copy them down from the notes later. I want you to get the concept now. And rule four is really dealing with asymptote lines. And the asymptote lines that we have are four are zeros at infinity. If we have three zeros at infinity, we have three root locus branches that are approaching those zeros at infinity. And these asymptotes tell us how those branches of the root locus are going to behave asymptotically. As you crank up the gain K, those branches will approach these asymptote lines. We've already played with a couple of these asymptote lines. We played when we had an asymptote at minus 180 or 180. We were zipping a branch of our root locus off to minus infinity, negative infinity. We played with asymptotes at plus and minus 90 when we simply had two poles and our root locus branches went vertical. Now we want to look at the cases where we might have more than one or two asymptotes, or where we might have more than one or two zeros at infinity. And the zeros at infinity are given to us when we compare the open loop poles, number of those, versus the number of finite zeros. Rule four then says we are looking for how do we sketch these asymptote guidelines or these asymptotes? And we can do it by just computing two different values or using two formulas. We actually, in the asymptote angles, we may get more than one number out of that. PZ sub E, say that fast three times, PZ sub E, 
That's pole zero excess. That's the variable that I'm using. If that's three, then PZ sub E is three, and we will have angles phi sub A, these asymptote angles, of zero, well, when we plug in L, we'll have zero, one, up to PZ sub E minus one. So if PZ sub E was three, we will have zero, one, two for L in that formula, and we will have three asymptote angles. If we have three angles, now this is like we're going back and we now have a birthday party. And how many played pin the tail on the donkey? You thought you outgrew that. No, I'm going to bring it, that back. We're now pinning the asymptotes on the z-plane. And we need to figure out where do we pin these three asymptote angles. They're all going to intersect at one point on the real line. We want to know what's the centroid for that center of the asymptotes. And that's the sigma sub a value, which is simply computed by summing all of your pole values, subtracting off all of the zero values, and dividing by your pole zero excess. That's all there is to sketching these asymptote lines. Your branches do not lie on these asymptotes. They approach them. In some cases, they do lie right on those. If you had two poles, just two poles, then you're going to move, be moving right along those asymptotes. But in general, these are asympto asymptotes, and you approach them asymptotically. Here is just an example. In this example, I have three poles. I have no finite zeros. What's my pole zero excess? Three. So now my fundamental asymptote angle is 180 divided by three, or it's 60 degrees. And I hope that's somewhat believable as a 60 degree angle. That's why you don't want to lose your protractor on the final. You want to bring it and maybe have it. Maybe you want to tape it so, well, you don't want to cover up the tick marks, do you, on your protractor, but you may want to paint on it and make it shine instead of having completely see-through. It's hard to see on this gray floor when it falls on the gray floor. Inside joke, maybe. Anyway, where was I? 60 degrees an angle, then we have an asymptote at 180 and another one at 300. And that little green dot is the centroid. And that's found by summing all of the poles. And this example is easy because I have two poles that are at zero. I can add zero plus zero, and I can still do that algebra or math. That's zero. Plus, let's say, one. Then I divide one plus zero plus zero by the pole zero excess, which is three. That dot should be at one-third. And that one-third is now where I pin the centroid of those three angles at. And then I can quickly sketch the root locus. I have one pole at the origin going to the right. I have another pole going to the left. The pole at z equal one is going to the left. I'm going to have two that collide, they break away, one goes towards the upper asymptote, the other goes down, and one zips off to minus infinity. That's my root locus. Will this system with two poles at the origin and one pole at one, is this ever going to be stable with a constant gain controller? Will this system ever be stable? Where is my unit circle? It has a radius of one. Is it possible that I can stabilize this system with just a gain? Superimpose the unit circle on that and my rightmost pole is at one. Then there is a region of gain 
decay that will stabilize because that gain, that pole at one is going to go to the left. That's going to move inside the unit circle. One of the poles at the origin is going to go to the right, staying on the real axis. One of the poles at the origin is going to zip off to minus infinity. But there is a region where there's from k equals zero up to some value where you will be stable for this three-pole system with just a gain controller. Is that clear? And you could check to determine which branch exited the unit circle first by comparing the gains on these two that are going towards the asymptotes. You, they're going to exit at the same time you would find the gain that gets you right to the unit circle for those off the axis and you could calculate the gain to get you to minus one and comparing those two gains you would pick the smaller of those and say oh I need to keep my gain less than that value to remain stable. Is that clear? That's rule number four. Rule number five I didn't know really how to summarize this or make it into a concise, so I just said, oh, it's really sort of the direction of the root locus near complex poles and or complex zeros. That's what this rule is trying to determine. And we are going to, and I ran out of Greek letters, so I'm using alpha for an angle. And I have a alpha sub d for a departure, so alpha for angle, d for departure. If I have two complex poles, the root locus leaves those poles, and I would like to know at what angle does it leave those poles? Does it leave those poles at a 40 degree angle? Does it leave those poles at a 90 degree angle? Does it leave those poles at 180 degree? Is it clear what I'm meaning by that? And it will be, I think, if I show you the picture. The two pictures. I just like that one on the right. But that's dealing with arrival angles. How do, the, how do the branches of the root locus arrive at the complex zeros? In the leftmost sketch, the departure angle is roughly 135 degrees. That clear? Alpha sub d is, let's say, 135. What is the arrival angle at the uppermost zero on the right? Roughly. You don't have to be exact. Is it 90 degrees? No, it's getting close to 180, isn't it? It's coming in from the left. And if it has a little bit of a slope down, then maybe it's a little less. Alpha sub A, the arrival angle, on the uppermost right root locus is, let's say, 175 degrees. So when you calculate the angle of arrival for that zero, you would compute something like 175 degrees. That would be, we are wanting in rule five to compute these alphas. Alpha sub d, the departure angle, or alpha sub a, the arrival angle. Let's now look at playing with some of these rules via example. Or first, let's just gain some insight into rule number four. Suppose that somebody has a root locus or they want to sketch a root locus and they know that they have, those are supposed to be complex conjugates. Maybe you have a pole there and a zero there. And now somebody is interested in the behavior of the root locus far away from those finite locations of the poles and the zeros. They would be they would like to know where 
are my branches of the root locus going and in really what direction and where is that direction located? How many asymptotes are you going to have for this constellation, this collection of poles and zeros? How many asymptotes will you have? We are interested in the following question. We are trying to determine far away What does, let me say, the above if we went far away from that pole zero diagram, this is our Z plane. If you went really far away from that location close to the origin, if you moved quite a ways away from that, what would that pattern of poles and zeros look like? This is not a really deep concept. If you're now quite a ways away from that, What's that effectively going to look like? That pattern of poles and zeros. Is that question that unclear? What's your pole zero excess? Two, that was easy. If your pole zero excess is two and you get really far away from this collection of poles and zeros and it effectively looks like two poles, doesn't it? When you get really far away from that, the net effect of three poles and a zero is going to look like two poles. That's the whole idea behind rule four. If that's the case, then what we are saying really far away from, we now have effectively two poles. And if that's the case, what do we know has to be true with respect to The root locus. What do we know is true when we're dealing with a root locus? If we've now approximated the behavior away from these We've said, oh, what, let's just condense these three poles and one zero down to two poles. Now if I said, oh, is this point on the root locus, how would you determine that? What do we know is true about the root locus? We have two conditions, a magnitude condition and a phase condition. Which one is important in determining if that red dot is on the root locus? The phase. The phase needs to be 180 degrees. So we now have, this is now looking like Let's say, and that piece of A is actually going to be located at the centroid of that pole zero collection. This point right here is sigma sub A. 
and we now de to determine whether or not a point is on the root locus, we would say, oh, let's just look at what's happening here, and I would say, well, then I must have the angle from this top pole. They're lying on top of each other. I'm just trying to exaggerate the fact that I have two so that I've offset those. But I have a theta P1, and I have another angle from the lower pole, and it's the same angle, isn't it? Which says that for those, that red dot that I have now sketched, for it to be belonging to the root locus, I need the sum of those angles from those two poles to equal minus 180 degrees. And in fact, those two poles share exactly the same angle since they're right on top of each other. I could now just rewrite that as theta P1 is equal to theta P sub 2. I now have two theta P1s combining to give me minus 180 degrees. I can solve that for theta P1, which in fact is the asymptote angle, phi sub A, which is 180 degrees divided by 2, and that's 90 degrees. And that was because we had a pole zero excess of 2. That's where these formulas are coming from. And this sigma sub A, which we call the centroid, of our root locus asymptotes, that's really the point on the real line, the real line or the real axis point where these asymptotes actually are centered. And we can compute that, sigma sub A, by taking all of the poles that are coming from our plant and controller. We take away or we subtract all of the zeros and we divide by the pole zero excess. And all of these angles, these asymptote angles, are determined by taking 180 degrees and dividing by the pole zero excess and then just taking the odd multiples of that up until we reach a value of pole zero excess minus one. All right, I keep using those formulas. Let's look at an example with some specific numerical val numbers. Suppose we're given a G of Z that is two over Z plus one half Z minus three fourths and Z minus one. In worrying about this or sketching the root locus, one of the first things that I 
start thinking about is the pole zero access. We have three finite poles. We do not have any finite zeros. Our pole zero access is three. That now allows us to immediately compute the angles that we need for our asymptotes. Our asymptote angles are now going to be determined from that phi sub a formula, which is now 2L plus 1 times 180 degrees all divided by 3, and L is going to go up to 2 from 0. Or, we now have, with L equal to 0, we simply have 180 degrees divided by 3. With L equal to 1, we now have 3 times 180 degrees divided by 3. I'm kind of not multiplying that out. It's 540, but I'm going to divide by 3, so why don't I just leave the 3 out front. And then I have 5 times 180 divided by 3. I have a lot of 180s divided by 3, and I think we can do that math. That math says that we now have 60 degrees for one of the angles. This is now 180 degrees. It's easier to cancel the threes. This one, maybe it's easier to take 5 times 60 and say, oh, we have one of these asymptote angles at 300. The only remaining piece of data that we need to worry about is where we pin those three asymptotes that are leaving or departing the real line, one at 60, one at 180, and one at 300. We need to worry about the centroid or where they are centered on the real line. And that's this sigma sub a computation which we had one pole at minus one-half. We have another pole at positive three-fourths and another pole at positive one. We add those up. We have minus one-half plus three-fourths plus one. We actually don't have any zeros. I'm just going to explicitly show you that we would subtract something there if we had some finite zeros in the picture. We do not, so I just have minus nothing. I divide that by 3. I now have combining those three pole locations, I end up with 1 and a quarter, and I divide that by 3, and I end up with 5 twelfths. Or that's somewhere between 4 twelfths which is a third, 0.333, and 6 twelfths, which is a half. That's 0.5. So now I'm halfway between 0.333 and 0.5, or sigma sub a in this case, is now 0 0.416, and that 6 just goes on, but let me just... You're not going to have four digits of accuracy in your sketch, okay? You'll be lucky if you get hundreds. So you're looking at a centroid of 0.42 on your sketch. And now you have the ability to sketch this root locus a little bit more easily than what we had before. We have our unit circle
that's about the best quarter of a circle I've drawn all semester. I'm just going to sit and look at that for a while. Now, I knew I should just concentrate on the one that I drew because I, the others would just get worse. But you get the idea. There's our unit circle. We have one pole at one. We had another pole at three-fourths, didn't we? Yes, and another pole at minus one-half. Do you see which pieces of the real line are belonging to the root locus? Just by those three poles? You split your French bread into how many pieces? Or how many cuts have you made in your French bread? Three. That's how many poles and zeros you have. And which of those, now you have four pieces of French bread or four pieces of real line segments. You want to now know which of those belong to the root locus. Is the one from one to infinity on the root locus? No, because there's not an odd number to the right, but there is here. And this one is going off to the left. But what did we just learn from our previous rule number four? We have a centroid at point four two. So if we go to one half and then go down a little bit below that, let's say there's our centroid. We have one asymptote at 60 degrees, Another one at 180, I'm not even going to sketch that one, and we have another one at 300. All of those angles are measured with the positive real line going off to the right. So that 300 is also minus 60. Those now are the guidelines that we can use to sketch these two branches of the root locus this one's going to go here, and that one's going to go there. Does it really matter where they break away in this real quick sketch? Probably not. But I could ask you to calculate that on the final if I wanted to, and you should be able to find that. That's the relative maximum between 0.75 and 1 of our gain formula for K, which will be a function of those three pole factors divided by 2. 2 was in the numerator. But in this case, if we're quickly sketching this, I can just say, oh, it's somewhere in there, and let me just do this, and this one goes down. Those are supposed to be symmetric. They're mirror images. What's happening in the positive quadrant is happening symmetrically in the lower quadrant. And now it's maybe clear that we could stabilize this system for certain values of gain, k. But this point right here is our sigma sub a, and this angle is the fundamental asymptote b sub a that's 60 degrees. Let me, well, what did I do next? Oh, I don't know why I focused on the breakaway point, but I did. Do I need to worry about that? I do to if I want to follow my notes, and I better follow my notes, huh? How, what's the formula for the breakaway point? And what does that breakaway point involve? The reason I'm going through this is because I looked at one of the old lectures and there hadn't been very many views on YouTube, so I was disappointed. Looks like you're just looking at the notes. If you're not listening to the audio, I better give you some more notes, huh? <laughs> that 
almost rips my heart completely out. And what what zeta is that? Remember remember the zeta? Our logarithmic spiral. Oh, not very many views on one of those YouTube videos. It's obviously not gone viral. But what's the formula for K? You'll need to know this on the final. What's in the... This is K times 2 over Z minus 1, Z minus 3 fourths, and Z plus 1 half. That's the magnitude condition. Now can you give me the K formula? I'll just do it backwards. And if you're given enough time, well, it's not going to take you that much time because how many values of Z do you need to check for this breakaway? If you were numerically computing the, these values for K, how many Zs would you need to use? Where are you playing? From 1 to infinity? No. You're getting lucky, aren't you? The problem is giving you some luck here. You just have to compute between 0.75 and 1. And you might start halfway between those. You know it's going to be a little bit off of that, but maybe you could compute four values for Z and be done with it. Roughly, because you're only, you're not splitting hairs that are very fine here. Because this is all on paper and pencil. But if you looked at this, you could even sketch it on your calculator. If you found the relative max of K, you would find, I hope, that that occurs at a value of Z of 0.881. And the K, if you evaluate that formula at Z equal to 0.881, you end up with K equaling 0.011. So it doesn't take much K to get you to the breakaway point, does it? You barely had to turn that K knob. That K knob, you only had to turn up a little bit beyond 100, 0 0.011, and now you've already slammed those two poles into each other on the real line between 0.75 and 1, and they've collided at 0.881. What do you hope is true, maybe, under that scenario? Or given that K value, can you now tell me anything about is it still stable for a slightly larger K? How would you determine that? What are some critical locations on that root locus? If you forgot your calculator on the final, please don't. But if you do, what would you do? You might start labeling this root locus with different symbols. Triangles, squares, clouds, stars. And then start saying, oh, this is K sub star. And I would need k sub star to be less than k sub square or something to that effect. And that would give me my bounds on k. For example, suppose that we said, well, this is one critical value for k, and that would be its twin. That's at the same k value. We might also be interested in the gain to get us to minus 1. And we could say k sub square. Suppose k sub square is bigger than k sub triangle. Which one determines the upper limit on stability for k? The smaller of those, k sub triangle. 
But the one that's easy to compute is k sub square, isn't it? Let's do that first. Let's say that we now wanted to find k with z equal to minus 1. That's now minus 1 plus 1 half times minus 1 minus 3 fourths minus 1 minus 1 all over 2. Or we have 1 half 7 fourths 2 and 2. And even if you forgot your calculator, you could do this. We know the gain now in decimal form is a little less than 1. It's 7 eighths. It's 0 0.875. That's the gain to get you that third pole, closed loop pole, to the border of stability going out minus 1 at minus 180 degrees. Now, is that the upper limit of stability? I wouldn't go that far, would you? Because it didn't take much gain to get to the breakaway. That went to the breakaway at 0 0.011. It's probably not going to take us to 0.875 to get to that triangle, is it? So we could pretty e quickly determine if our sketch is somewhat accurate. We could figure out what K at the triangle is. What is K triangle? Well, we know that the breakaway occurred at what value? 0 0.881, and that triangle is a little to the right, probably, of that breakaway. So we could say that the real part of that triangle is 0.9, roughly. This isn't a hard science. I know this really made my Engineering 102 class nervous when I started saying, just pick a number. They wanted it to the sixth decimal place. They said, I'm in engineering to be accurate. Well, you're in engineering to try to get the right answer, the right ballpark. What happened to our visitor? He went off on that. He was chasing that infinite zero. What was the angle of that infinite z? See what you miss if you don't come to class? People watching this video are going, what the world is he talking about? Visitor. Some of you in class aren't even clear what I'm talking about. <laughs> Have to be in the right quadrant, I guess. Where were we? We're trying to find the gain at K sub delta, right? And point nine, we could just eyeball that and say, well, I don't know, it's about point four three. If you had done this on an engineering had, maybe it would be pretty close to what it actually is. And now you could say, oh, that's approximately then z minus 1, z minus 3 fourths, z plus 1 half, all over 2, and you're evaluating that at 0.9 plus j 0 0.43, and that's then 0 0.1472. Now, you could check your work. Could you determine if that gain K is going to give you stable or unstable values? Could you check your work without too much effort? Now that you've found the K, you know your closed loop pole formula. Your closed loop poles, this is all supposed to be fitting together. 
because if you're now talking about your system with your boss and you're just sitting over a cup of coffee, you may need to be doing this on a, a napkin. And you want to demonstrate some of the thought process behind this design. What governs the closed loop poles? What formula? You could write down the block diagram or sketch the block diagram and compute it if you didn't remember. It's this 1 plus k. We didn't have any controller. The controller was just the gain k. This is what governs our closed loop poles. We now have 1 plus 2k over z minus 1, z minus 0.75, z plus one half equaling zero. The numerator of that expression is what determines our closed loop poles. Or it's what gives us our characteristic equation, which is now z minus one, z minus point seven five, z plus point five plus 2k, and now we want k equal to 1.4, whatever I just, not 1.4. That would have been unstable, wouldn't it? Because 0.875 was zipping outside minus 1. This is 0 0.1472, set that equal to 0. If one were to do that, we would find that we have closed loop poles for that choice of gain at 0.94 plus and minus j 0.42. Wow. We said 0.9 plus j 0.43. That's not too bad. And the other one? If that was a positive number, would you have known you'd made a mistake in the algebra? That one has to be to the left of minus one half, doesn't it? the way the three poles are moving along the root locus branches. And what are we interested in for stability? Relative to those numbers. What's going to tell us whether we're stable or not? The magnitude of these need to be less than one. If we compute the magnitude of this first complex number, 1.03, this one, I'll compute that magnitude. It's 0.63. So a gain of 0 0.1472 is a little bit much, isn't it? But not by much. We could then say, well, let's just be a little bit more conservative and say, for stability, let's just round that down and say that that's our upper bound. And now we have a range of k for stability. that may be a conservative upper bound. What if we looked at a particular value of k and we wanted to know how fast is our system going to be? Suppose we let k actually equal something less than 0.11 and maybe we let it be 0 0.011. What kind of poles will that give rise to? Now pick k equal to 0 0.011. What have we done? What, what are our closed loop poles? Z 
We have three real poles, don't we? If that's right at the breakaway. One is between minus one half and minus one. It's okay because we know that we can crank up the gain to 0.875 before that one goes outside the unit circle. So now we have three. If k is equal to 0 0.011, we have now produced It's getting as tired as I am. Three real poles. What's the dominant pole? If we cranked up the gain to 0.14, the 1 on the left is 0.63. If our gain is 0 0.011, where is that pole located? On the leftmost axis. Is it to the right or to the left of minus 0.631? If it took a gain of 0.15 to get to that, and we're only cranking up the gain to 0 0.011, we're somewhere between minus 0.5 and minus 0.63. And that's faster than 0 0.88. 0 0.88 is our dominant mode. We have two at that location. Let's now say that our dominant pole is at z equal to 0. 881. And now somebody wants to know, and you did this pretty well on the exam, you can use this formula to compute the settling time and number of sample periods. N sub s is now minus 2 over the log base 10 of r. Our system now roughly will be settling in 37 sample periods. Now your boss says that's too slow. You turn in your letter of resignation and leave? No. You're a wildcat. Right? You don't give up that easy. What do you do if this is too slow? What's one possibility? This was just a pure gain controller, wasn't it? You go with a PID. Oh, I'm sorry, a PID, proportional integral derivative. That might help speed things up to put that derivative piece in there. Now you have a couple of zeros to play around with, and we'll go over that next time, the PID controller. Let's. Wow, Let, we're really flying through this material. Let's get into rule number five, which are the departure angles. When we're dealing with poles and angle of arrival, if we have complex zeros. Suppose that I give you an example. With g of z equaling 2 times z minus 
one half and z minus one squared plus one half squared. Is it clear where our poles and zeros are in the z-plane? I have a finite zero at one-half. Where are my poles? At one plus and minus one half. Now, with this pattern of poles and zeros, do you know what real line segment might belong to the root locus? How many pieces of French bread do you have? One two, three, or four. To count of three, I want to see fingers. How many line segments do you now have identified with this pattern of pole and zero? At the count of three, one, two, three, or four. One, two, three. I'm seeing a lot of threes. Where did that come from? Actually, when you're dealing with the line, se the real line segment, you don't have to worry about poles and zeros off the real line in determining the segments that might live on the root locus. You just have to focus on the poles and zeros on the real line. How many poles and zeros are on the real line? One. So we have one singularity. That's cutting your French bread at one location. You have two pieces of the real line identified. One to the right of one half and one to the left of one half. Which piece is on the root locus? The left piece. What's happening? What's the pole zero excess? One. How many asymptotes do we have? Or how many pole? How many zeros at infinity do we have? The same as pole zero excess. And you just told me we had a pole zero excess of one. We have one zero at infinity. Something as k gets big is going to go off to minus infinity. How many branches of the root locus do we have? Two. We have two because we have two poles, don't we? Now, how are the poles, how are the branches from those two poles going to leave or depart from those complex poles? That's what Rule 5 is worried about. Do they go up at 90 degrees? Do they go right at 0 degrees? Where are they going to end up? These branches of the root locus. They have to end up to the left of the zero, don't they? They're going to re-enter to the left of that zero, and one's going to zip off to the left at minus infinity. The other one's going to approach that finite zero. We know that's the behavior of our root loci. So these come in somewhere. And we could find that re-entry point. What we're interested in is how do they depart from those poles. And in this case, I have sketched a departure angle of, I don't know, 120 degrees. Is that clear? 
let's figure out how we could find that alpha sub d. What do we know is true about that root locus? What do we know about the angle of our poles and zeros? If it's on the root locus, what do we know this angle must be? The algebraic angle is minus 180 degrees. So if we went somewhere close to that pole, let's just draw a hypothetical dot, and now we measure this angle, we measure this angle, and if we're really close to that pole, we might as well just consider that angle to be defined by where that pole is up above. And the angle from that zero to that dot is basically the angle from the zero to that x, that pole. So we can compute those two angles, can't we? We can compute the angle from the zero to that x. We can compute the angle from that lower x to the upper x. What's that? I'm, I, I apologize for those of you watching this didn't get to see that robotic turn. What was that robotic turn equaling in degrees? 90 degrees. What's the angle from that zero to the pole? And I judiciously selected these locations. You take that zero and you walk over one half. How far up do you go? One half. What's that angle? 45 degrees. So the angle from the zero to that pole, pole is 45. The angle from the lower pole to the upper pole is 90. You can algebraically sum those together with this unknown angle, alpha sub d, and those need to equal minus 180. Question? So now the question is, do these, oh, when, they, when these poles start off the real axis, I don't know. Go home and verify that. The question was, do they form a radius now? And they probably will with this clean of a setup, with one zero and two poles. If we have other zeros and poles, then you can't do that. But here the question was, can I just get out my compass and draw an arc to complete the root locus from that? The tip of my compass is in that zero, and the pin, or the pencil end of my compass, is on that pole, and I'm just going to sketch that circle. But let's compute. Is it clear what we can compute now? We have this expression now implies that we have the angle from our zero. That's upstairs, and we subtract the angle of z minus 1 minus j 1 half, that's the upper angle pole, and we have z minus 1 plus j 1 half, that's the lower pole angle, and that's supposed to equal minus 180 degrees. So we have minus 180 degrees is equal to theta sub z, that's this angle, this angle, let's say, is theta sub p sub 2. So we have minus, and inside here, this is actually, whoops, I said I was going to call those alphas. This is alpha sub d plus theta sub p sub 2. And I selected those locations to be easy to compute. Theta sub z was 45. The departure angle we don't know, but theta sub p sub 2 was 90 degrees. We can now solve this 
for alpha sub d, just move that to the left and we now have 180 degrees plus 45 degrees minus 90 degrees, which is 45 less than 180, that's 135 degrees. Is that sort of what I looks like I've sketched here? That angle, alpha sub d, is 135 degrees from the, re the positive real line to the right of that pole. Are there questions on that? This is how you use rule 5 to determine how your angles or your root, root locus branches depart from complex poles and how they could arrive at complex zeros. And so you might go home and see if you can figure out that arrival angle for that particular pole zero pattern. And you could check your work with MATLAB. In MATLAB, thank you for being so patient. I've already gone over. Oh, uh, no wonder you guys haven't left. If your transfer function was G, you could say R locus G, and you can sketch your root locus in MATLAB. If you actually wanted to find a gain value somewhere on your root locus, you could say R locus find. And then you can click on the root locus to find the gain to get you to that point. If you're being too patient, thank you.